Hello everyone, today we talk about the end of the Comnenian dynasty and more specifically therefore of the reigns of Alexius II and especially of Andronicus I. In another video we will see the consequences of this which are important on the ground of you know, the historiographical explanation of, of the cause of the sudden uh, collapse during the Fourth Crusade. Some authors stress fundamentally that everything was going relatively well and that the, the empire was stable. It was on the surface but as we will see now already some you know um, prodromes of incursions in, at the time of Andronicus the first at the hands of the Normans but also important um, re the territorial acquisitions by the uh, by at the hands of, of the Hungarians uh, on the Serbs on the Danubian, Danubian frontier um, and generally speaking, this situation of chronic uh, political instability, that is the same one we would actually call actively the Crusaders, and that could have possibly caused, actually, the the conquest of Constantinople at the hand of the Germans, hadn't Henry VI died um, before time. And this is a trend that had already been set before. This time, the Comnenians had given an important stability to the empire, important expansion. So this period we talk today starts effectively at the death of Manuel I, Comnenus, that is considered one of the, uh, you know, even in here there are historiographical variations. I am, you know, influenced by the work of Magdalena written by on this that uh, is quite convincing in my opinion, but it still shows in a sense the, you know, the crisis that was um, uh, that point that the emperor was actually favoring in a in a positive sense because he had realized that the western models and the, the private system feudalism if you want was something actually more paradoxically more mm, gluing and and stabilizing than the uh, you know the older tradition that uh, at the end of the day of statalism if you want that the Comnenians paradoxically had already surpassed by themselves right it had been possible uh, to restore an important degree of centralization up to the time of Basil II, and arguably was already too late. The Comnenians had p practically privatized, definitely, the system, but still in a way that was not as extensive as the Western one. So we will we have made a video about Manuel, and we will now see mostly some consequences of his policy, in, uh, at least for how they were uh, addressed by his son and uh, Alexis and, and Andronicus causing that uh, you know had in fact a different especially Andronicus at least kind of reversed what had been um, Manuel's policy in, the, in Manuel's policy in, in that regard and actually with negative consequences which is eloquent in that regard um, in any case uh, after the brief government of the young son of Manuel Alexis II 1183 and of the regent, more than else, Mary of Antioch, who right, was the second wife of Manuel, the throne passed to Andronicus I. Um, Alexis' reign was, in fact, you know, dominated mostly by Andronicus himself, who uh, came to power, as we will see now, um, factually, already when, and maintaining Alexis on, on, on the throne for, for a while, so to, to provide with legitimacy uh, this this... Uh, co fundamentally and eventually rising as emperor himself and putting the same uh, Alexis to death, right? He had formally made Alexis condemning his own mother to death. Now, Andronicus' figure is, is quite interesting because in, in during Manuel's empire, this was essentially a, the most mo wanted man in many ways around. He, um, you know, he, w he was the cousin of Manuel uh, I, himself, it was the son of Isaac, and so they were grandchildren of Alexius. And they, um, and um, Andronicus initially was appreciated by Manuel, was a favorite at his court, etc., but eventually he participated to a, uh, uh, to, to, a, to a plot against the same cows, and there had already been some strained relations due to, as we'll see now, his love affairs, because um, Andronicus was a serial womanizer. 
right? And uh, it made a, a mess everywhere he went, you know, at, at a, a top political level, because, you know, he always managed to 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 fornicate with uh, basically the the top woman of of the kingdom or the state whatever he went uh, the 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 daughter of the reign uh, of the reigning ruler or others etc and for this reason he was basically most of his life an exile he also spent something like twelve years in prison in the same Byzantine Empire at the hands of Manuel he fled first to to Antioch when he seduced the daughter of the prince that was by the way the sister of uh, of the same Mary of Antioch, uh, Manuel's wife. Um, he went to Jerusalem. He was given by um, Baldwin did the the fifth of Beirut. Then he went to Damascus. Uh, then he uh, he had been originally taken prisoner by the the Sultan um, the Sultan of, of Rome. Um, it's it's important to to stress that also he had some inc some connection with the ancestral lands of the Komnenoi on on the Black Sea between um, si Sinope and um, and uh, Amaziah, if I'm not wrong. And he, um, at some point, he, he fled to, to Russia, to his cousin, who was the, the, prin grand, uh, the prince. Uh, and uh, he, at that point, kind of reapproached Manuel. They, they waged joint operation uh, on the Danube. Uh, and, and so he's a very fascinating figure telling the truth, but however, a uh, quite uh, you know quite difficult one to manage uh, in many ways. And he um, he would display this you know su such traits as we'll see in his reign that will also kind of make you doubt about his own whatever you know he was a, a, a restless soul um, in a sense. Um, what had happened so during Alexis reign uh, fundamentally the, the rage against the 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 Latins the the foreigners broadly meant also the Franks had increased because Manuel had been uh, very esterophile in many ways he had settled lots of Westerners in the Empire Knights um, from from everywhere mostly from from Sicily but um, really whoever could join what was welcome as long as you know the sense that did not side with the local Byzantine aristocracy w that he tried to to oust more than much there were still the presence of course of the Italians as the main mercantile um, uh, you know pre community in in Constantinople and in other areas of the Empire the same Mary of Antioch was the daughter in fact of, of the prince and so at this point her regency was embodying a sort of um, Latin presence in Constantinople that uh, at the death of Manuel was, you know, if you think about all his, um, you know, his uh, supporters, etc., that had that had prospered in the wake of that policy, now uh, were seen, with, uh, looked upon with great uh, hatred. And the, and, and Andronicus put himself at the head of this anti-governmental -go revolt. He moved from, in fact, uh, Pontus, um, where he had gone to be, actually, to, to settle in exile as, a for, as he had been forgiven. Here is a bit of a complex story, um, but it's not part of his reign, at least. And the rebels were strongly animated by the hostility, as we've seen towards the Westerners, that had settled in great number, really, in the Empire. And especially for commercial reasons. Mm -hmm. um, after the the great movement of men that had been typical of the period of, of the Crusades, right? The Comnenians were the ones that, at that point, so so the Crusades happening for the first time in the Empire, and uh, the the threat the, that the crusading armies passing by the city and uh, this broader pressure and influence infiltration it could present was always a threat to the security of the same capital, and and that's in fact the trend that we're talking about before that would culminate in 1204. Um, so you can you can argue of a lack of integration among the different uh, different ethnicities, the different the religious differences and the privileges that the Westerners often enjoyed, uh, suscitating a based opposition in in the name of some sort of Byzantine nationalism. 
Um, this, of course, because the empire was still held by Byzantine ar aristocracy. And so Manos of Force were probably positive in, in as much he understood more than else, not just that he could substitute the, the Byzantines, uh, you know, I mean, the, the Westerners with the Byzantines, but that in the com post command, etc. But especially in the army and in, in this situation of permeability of the frontiers and of this Western overflow that was happening anyway to, let's say, buy them, right, to show them that the empire was rich, that it paid, that it offered an opportunity and that therefore it was better to side with him rather than taking arms against him. And this had brought to, uh, in fact, this this kind of esterophilia, apparently, especially for a, for a Byzantine society that, as you know, already at this point was importantly traditionalist and um, it was, you know, had become ever more xenophobic uh, and in part, you know, understandably because of this uh, evident incumbent Western pressure. Um, and um, Andronicus, from the province of Pontus, of which he was governor, governor, in fact, marched on Constantinople. He quite easily had uh, the upper hand on the government forces. And his entrance in the city in May 11. 82 was preceded by a massacre of the Latins, the most famous one in Byzantine history, from the side of the crowd that had excited by the imperial agents. And the massacre hit heavily the Genoese and the peasants that were present in Constantinople, they were killed or sold as slaves to the Turks, but not the Venetians. Um, paradoxically, because they, these had already been dispossessed and they they hadn't yet repopulated their quarter in the Byzantine capital, which paradoxically would favor Venice because, of course, the you know her competitors were taken out that easily, and uh, and of course Constantinople could yeah could at, at least that Andronicus had mm, was very much anti-Latin in, in policy. But, as always, the Empire could not work without the Latins. They needed trade, and Venice was the only, in this sense, uh, the most powerful element remained in um, uh, around, at least, and or at least at the in, in relative terms, given that her opponents had been that weakened. And so, in a short while, um, there was a resuming of the diplomatic and commercial relations. So, things actually came back quickly as before. But this event was quite quite upsetting because you know from a western perspective you know it, it was normal in a sense that this would happen even it happened even among the same westerners that they, they would compete against one another and they would confiscate uh the goods locally every once in a while and, and stop trade or they would resume this was a big thing it was a big massacre and and therefore something that in perspective also the west began to you know resent uh importantly against the uh the byzantines in general, because it showed what 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 the possibility was, and initially Andronicus, um, and it's meaningful that, by the way, he um, uh, you know Andronicus would actually put to death uh, Alexis, his, his nephew, as we've seen. He literally had this and and the same matter. That he has this ferocious revenge against his cows, and and so his whole policy and persona were fundamentally oriented in an anti-Latin sense. And and this brought, initially, to be very much appreciated by his own subjects, with his mm, policy of closure towards the West. But he soon thus found himself in a dangerous situation of interna international isolation. And not you know, being in, uh, impossible at that point to, to deal with Genoa and Pisa, given the bloodshed they had carried out, um, he turned in, as we've seen in 1183, to Venice in sign of benevolence. He released the last prisoners. The negotiations went on quickly, and between summer and autumn of 1183, uh, an agreement was concluded in which um, there, there would be in favor of the Venetians the restitution of the Constantinopolitan quarter, the um, essentially compensation in annual rates for the damages that had 
that, that Venice had suffered in 1171 in Constantinople for, for a total of 1500 pounds of gold, the renewal of the privileges, and so this brought the Venetians to come back in good number in the empire and exercising their traffics and resuming control of the quarter of the capital. However, the first refounding rate was not immediately sent, and only in 1185 uh, the Venetians um, obtained uh, 100 pounds of gold that were used to partially refound those who had uh, suffered damage at at the hand of Manuel Comnenus at, at the time. Um, Andronicus Comnenus in September 1183 obtained the uh, crown of co-emperor initially and eventually he as we've seen took out Alexis and Mary um, and when he um, he was a, in power fully at least he uh, undertook a radical statal reform that was aimed at eliminating those forms of um, degeneration let's say of public life that he sustained with um, methods of ferocious brutality. In fact, he, uh, you know, was operating, namely, against corruption, persecuting the uh, the, the supporters of Manuel, especially the great um, nobility, the private ones that was, um, you know, very, you know, v v becoming ever more powerful. This was this attempt, broadly speaking, not just to counter the the foreign elements, but rather the 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 spread of uh, privatization, right, in a centralistic sense, and uh, as a consequence of this, however, his um, Andronicus' reign was transformed in into a, ter a terror regime, right? It was marked by this violent clash against the no the same Byzantine nobility, that was quite a dangerous game, as we will see now, because they were still de facto the only ones who ruled in the empire in the first place and the the Comnenian dynasty had fundamentally built all its power around itself this circle of few families that were all married into each other and that basically owned everything and the rest the population basically didn't that's the reason why there wasn't even kind of a thriving middle class that they had to you know in order for making trade they needed the Italians and the uh, this this was accompanied by also the you know, countering the degeneration of the administrative apparatus that, in this sense, had driven ever more away from the the public, let's say, uh, or let's say, power properly or better, the, the monarchic one, because this is was the real point. At this point, it was not really, or you know, it could it couldn't even be thought to uh, to to restore the um, a central state, right? That was long gone since the 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 the, 11th, the 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 early 11th century, at the latest, right at this point, it was just trying to to take out the this main uh, oligarchs and to accumulate power in an ever more monarchic fashion. So this naturally brought to some problems to the same empire because while it is true that the emperor managed to make some traditional forms of corruption cease, but for example, you know the the purchase of public offices or the extortions of of the fisc. Um, his position as a ruler um, was sensibly weakened by this. The the also the military apparatus was was weakened as he um, purged the pro pronoyari that were essentially the backbone of the uh, of the th this kind of semi-feudal, mm, say, Byzantine version of feudal system fundamentally. It was slightly more centralized than, than in the West, but that at this point it was like, I don't know, during Stalin's purges that, you know, the best elements of the military were taken out. Uh, and the mm, and, and this class, in fact, it was scattered all over the empire, and of course the emperors at the time didn't really have a, a direct control on all the territory. They reacted. Um, so fueling a series of plots that were, whenever possible, repressed in blood. So what the situation was actually pretty messed up, as you understand. And the Byzantine armies, as a consequence, were not able to cope uh, with the attacks coming from the external. So much that Andronicus 
suffered heavy defeats at the hands of the Hungarians, the Serbs, the Normans. The Hungarians recovered the conquests of Manuel Komnenos that had uh, reinforced uh, the Danubian frontier, this was what the com bringing you know, to, to an important expansion, uh, uh, again, towards even properly the northeast along, um, uh, along all those territories, even up to Croatia, um, and s especially reinforcing the Danubian frontier itself. The, the Serbs that at this point were, you know, were squeezed by the, the Hungarians and the Byzantines, at this point were allied with the Hungarians because the Byzantines had become ever more oppressive and they were just uh, technically within the empire itself territorially and uh, and thus they obtained a new independence from Constantinople securing also territorial advantages at the detriment of the empire mm -hmm. but the heaviest blow came from the Normans of course that um, resuming the uh, old expansionistic project in the uh, in, in Greece in June 11 85 landed at Durakium and marching up to Thessalonica it was the the second and arguably only other true city of the empire that was sacked right 7000 Greeks were massacred uh, according to the sources and here the um, uh, the the Normans took in part the, the way to Constantinople this was a major success of William II that shows, in fact, this is also the moment in which the the Hauteville will marry to the, you know, will 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 leave the the kingdom of Sicily inheritance to to the Hohenstaufen, and there the Hohenstaufen would think to, they could take Constantinople as well. So uh, the Sicilo Normans had been by far the greatest threat posed to the Byzantine Empire in, in the last uh, centuries. To that there was no other no no other p power posed. M comparably any threat like that and striking Thessalonica and other you know uh, cities in, all over the Aegean and also on the Ionian was a major kind of uh, cyclo Norman strategy that was aiming at the end of the day of hitting uh, this coastal centers and aiming at, at Constantinople itself at some point so this last blow was so serious and, and impacting that the threat on, on on the on Constantinople caused the fall of Andronicus, who was lynched in the capital by the uh, the angry mob. In fact, uh, the thing started when, you know, he he had tried to kill yet another another nobleman who actually killed the the imperial guards at that point and entrenched himself. Um, was sheltered by the mob who rose in the city so uh, Andronicus was deposed and was killed in a most horrifying way he was tied to a place where he, his hand was was cut his one of his eyes was gouged all his teeth and hair were pulled out uh, boiled water was thrown into boiling water was thrown into his face and eventually he was brought to the hippodrome and cut to pieces uh, while he was still alive I mean this is the kind of you know there was also some symbolism uh, in uh, the the way he, he he died in that sense because you know he was considered very handsome very you know he had seduced all those great princesses and you know um, um, women of, of the imperial family and so on and so he was seen like uh, you know he, and especially because of the regime of terror that he had caused like just a a very negative figure morally etc and it was massacred in most in this most relevant way but this tells you Interestingly enough, given that the angels, uh, the the Angeli dynasty would would follow later, right? So and and so that the one that would cause further damage, as in 1204, uh, the situation would go on disgregating ever more rapidly. You can see. I mean, it's difficult not to see Andronicus reign as um, the actual. You know, the the the, the point of conjunction between the the you know, a, a Manuel's policy that probably had understood the need of westernizing and privatizing and kind of modernizing uh, uh, in, in a way that was happening a bit everywhere, also in the Muslim world, etc. The West, and, and generally speaking, the broader, uh, those traditions of Romanolinistic centralized bureaucratic states that had were collapsing. Look at I mean, Muslim Spain, 
uh, look at the, the caliphate in the first place in, in the Middle East. Um, the Westerners also were everywhere. So the Manuel had, I'm, I'm a great fan of Manuel Comnenus. I think he had gotten it completely right and he had actually consolidated the empire. And so this brusque um, counter move uh, politically by Andronicus was just a reaction and regurgitation of somebody who had not understood what the situation was. The massacre of the Latins was unnecessary. That settled the seed for some, you know, serious revenge. The Venetians, even though had not suffered the most for many hours, they remembered the 1171 one. They, they realized that as the, you know, they, they, they could have been massacred once again, just as it had happened by the, uh, to the peasants and the Genoese, uh, given that this, you know, uh, xenophobic uh, reaction that was taking place in the empire, and so um, the, the collapse, the, the the normal offensives, the the Hungarian and Serbian, um, uh, you know, comebacks on, and the Danube, etc., all show in this internal strife, the the purges of the military. That's terrifying, right? This all fits a disastrous policy of an empire that was losing the plot internally and and you ne never have to underestimate how quickly a state can collapse uh if of course there are the, some preconditions and some events happen but let's say mostly from a situation that apparently seems very stable right and so i'm actually convinced that in 1204 of course things might have gone differently right it wasn't necessarily the end of the empire it had to fall etc but this constant pushes and hits and and um, and difficulties that you see here, and that that this ever greater penetrability of the frontiers and so on, was definitely not a good indicator. And uh, however the thing went, um, the probably the situation even in in uh, in other possibilities would have not been probably the best one for for the empire in the first place. And. All right, for today we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.